Awesome. So thank you, Shirley, for lining this up and having me here. Um, I know you guys did a program with Mike Motes what, a couple months ago now. I can't remember exactly when that was, a few months ago, um, which I hope you guys all enjoyed, um, which has led me to me being here tonight uh, presenting with you guys, uh, talking about mirrorless cameras. Um, my name is Noah Buchanan. Um, for those of you who don't know me, and I don't think any of you probably know me. If you do, I apologize. Um, but uh, my name is Noah Buchanan. Uh, I've been working for Hunts Photo and Video uh, for a little over four and a half years now. Um, we're a photo and video retail operation based out of New England. We have five stores in Massachusetts, one store in Rhode Island, one store in New Hampshire, and one store in Maine, which is typically the store that I'm working out of. Uh, the tip of the store that I'm working out of when I'm not working from home, uh, which has been quite often uh, this year, um, it's been definitely a, a big change of pace. Typically, I'm traveling, doing trade shows and photography conferences all over the country. Um, this year, I've been doing all that from home, talking to different camera clubs, different photography groups online on Zoom, uh, presenting this pr presentation probably two times a week. Um, so it's definitely been a change of pace. Um, if you guys are ever looking for any photo gear, any photo equipment, please do reach out to me anytime. I'll have my contact info at the end. Uh, we sell a little bit of everything, photo, video, audio related. Uh, we have our own printing lab. We do education as well. So we do a little bit of everything at Hunts. Um, we ship all over the country. Um, so it's... Uh, Something that we enjoy doing is supporting all the different camera clubs around the country, uh, especially those clubs that don't have a local camera store to shop at anymore. We kind of want to be that local club for those areas that, uh, or that local store for those areas and those clubs that don't have one um, because photography stores are smaller and smaller and um, less and less now as time goes on. Um, and that's probably only going to continue to happen. Uh, you don't see many people opening up a brand new photography store anymore. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but uh, we're happy to still be around. So uh, we have no plans of going anywhere anytime soon. We've been around since 1889. We actually started off as a pharmacy and a drugstore and then transitioned into the uh, photography industry in the 90s. And uh, now full-fledged photo and video retailer. So a lot of fun stuff, uh, but I'm not going to bore you with all that information. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, and we can jump into this presentation here. Uh, as far as questions go, feel free to just put those down in the chat. Um, my program's about 40, 45 minutes. Uh, so we'll go about an hour with Q&A at the end. Uh, I'll double check the chat at the end, uh, answer any questions that you guys have, uh, open it up to any questions. If you guys want to unmute yourself and ask any questions that way, perfectly fine as well. We do have a little bit of a smaller group. So if you guys want to unmute yourself and talk at the end a little bit, that's perfectly fine with me. Uh, I just ask that you do stay muted during the presentation. So there's no background noise and no distractions for anybody else. So Without further ado, um, what we're talking about tonight is mirrorless cameras. And this is, as I mentioned before, a presentation that I've been doing pretty often, one or two times a week. I think I'm actually doing it three times this week. Um, and rightfully so, mirrorless cameras have gained a lot of popularity over the past couple of years, even more so the past year, year and a half, um, where there's a lot of information out there about mirrorless cameras. And I think that's definitely the way that the camera market is shifting. You're probably not gonna see as many new DSLRs coming out onto the market anymore. Um, every innovation and design that these companies are working on right now are truly in mirrorless cameras and lenses. And there's a lot of good reasons for that, which we'll talk a little bit about tonight. I myself have been shooting with a mirrorless camera for over three years now. Um, I switched over from Canon to Sony about three years ago and been very happy with that transition. No, have no plans of going back and using any DSLRs or at least purchasing any DSLRs. Uh, I should say I use a lot of different cameras uh, working for hunts, but for my own personal camera, I've been shooting with mirrorless uh, for about three years and it's been a huge advantage to me, which we'll talk about tonight, um, some of those key features. But first thing that I wanna get out of the way is what is a mirrorless camera? Because uh, I'm sure everybody's talking about it. Uh, there's a lot of buzz and a lot of um, communication going on and a lot of conversations that people are having about these mirrorless cameras, but what really is it and how does it differ from a DSLR? So with that being said, I have these two photos here um, side by side, a DSLR on the top and a mirrorless on the bottom. Both happen to be from Nikon. With a DSLR, all the light is gonna come in through your lens, uh, be reflected off that mirror in the back, be reflected up through the viewfinder and out the prism. So you're actually seeing the light being reflected out that viewfinder. You're seeing exactly what that lens is seeing. 
Now with a mirrorless camera, again, hence the name mirrorless, we don't have that mirror anymore. We don't have that prism and all the components that go along with it. We don't have an optical viewfinder anymore, but what we do have is an electronic viewfinder. And with a, a mirrorless camera, again, all the light's gonna come through the lens, but instead of being reflected off the mirror, it's gonna project directly onto the sensor. And when it projects directly onto the sensor, you can have a live feedback of that reading in your electronic viewfinder as well. So you can see exactly what the sensor is seeing. And we'll talk more about that electronic viewfinder in a little bit and some of the advantages of it, because there are a lot. Uh, but really in the simplest terms, a mirrorless camera is a camera that does not have a mirror in it. Uh, pretty straightforward with the name, but I do want to clarify and just kind of show kind of the inner workings of the two, uh, both DSLR and mirrorless. So why do you want to go mirrorless? Um, it's something that I think a lot of people are doing now. Um, I'm personally selling more mirrorless cameras to our customers than DSLRs. I sell very few DSLRs these days. Um, I still do sell some here and there, but really everything that is selling right now for the majority is mirrorless cameras. It's the latest and greatest technology. Um, you're finding the latest and greatest lenses for them as well. So that's kind of the way all these companies are focusing their efforts on. So if you're someone who's looking to get the latest and greatest technology, that is in mirrorless cameras, not in DSLRs. So why do you wanna go mirrorless um, besides the latest and greatest features? What else is there to offer? And the first thing is size. That's probably what comes up most often when people talking about mirrorless is the size difference and the size savings between the uh, mirrorless and DSLRs. You have fewer internal parts to take up space. So you don't have that mirror anymore. You don't have the prism, uh, which means a, uh, well, you don't have the optical viewfinder, I should say, which means a much less bulky prism. So you can see here just side by side, these two cameras, Nikon on the top and Canon on the bottom, that the prism on the cameras on the left is much smaller uh, because you don't have that optical viewfinder taking up so much space. But with the DSLR, because of that big bulky optical viewfinder, you're going to have a large prism. So you can see just side by side Nikon DSLR next to a Nikon mirrorless, Canon DSLR next to a Canon mirrorless, how small uh, they actually are. All of these are full frame cameras. So all of them have a full frame sensor in them. And you can just kind of get a good idea of what that size savings actually is. And that'll vary from camera to camera, uh, but traditionally it is going to be smaller when it comes to mirrorless. And then lastly, the flange distance is significantly shorter. So what is the flange distance? Kind of a strange word uh, when you're talking about cameras. Really all the flange distance is, is the measurement from the lens mount to the sensor plane itself. So I have an example of that here on the bottom in this pink line, that is actually the flange distance. So again, from the lens mount back to the sensor plane, you can see how much larger it is on the DSLR. That's because you have that mirror there taking up so much space. But with the mirrorless camera, again, we don't have that mirror anymore. So you're really saving a lot of size and making the camera a lot thinner. Reducing this pretty much affects almost all aspects of the camera design. So the size is, again, part of the design, how small it can be. Um, and just the design in general, it, you can see how much different looking just this grayed out version is compared to the grayed out DSLR next to it. And then lastly, it also allows for a greater choice in lens design and lens selection. So camera companies now are able to make lenses that are faster focusing, uh, they're smaller and more compact, and also have a faster f-stop. So you're gonna find lenses that are f1.2, f.95 even. Nikon just came out with the lens for their mirrorless system about a year ago, that's a 50 millimeter 0.95. And that camera can fully take advantage of all the light being absorbed at that 0.95 aperture, which previously with their DSLRs, the fastest aperture you could have is f1.4. Uh, anything wider than that, the camera wasn't going to be able to read all of that light, which is why you never saw any f1.2 Nikon lenses for any of their DSLRs, whereas Canon did have some f1.2 lenses. It's because of their flange distance allowed for that. So the flange distance does relate to a lot of different things more so than just size, the biggest being the lens choice and the lens selection that you have. So speaking of lens choice, adapting your DSLR lenses, either Nikon or Canon on, uh, onto their mirrorless system now is very seamless. Um, that's something that I think a lot of people are concerned about that they have a lot of Nikon counter Canon lenses that they don't want to transition over to mirrorless and have to buy a whole new set of lenses. Both of the adapters from Nikon and Canon work seamlessly with all of their full frame lenses. You can even use some of their crop frame lenses 
Uh, what'll happen though, when you use those crop frame lenses is it will crop down on the sensor a little bit. So you're not gonna get the maximum file size. You're gonna lose a little bit of resolution, uh, but you'll still be able to use those lenses and focus but it is going to crop down to compensate because it is a crop frame lens designed for a crop frame camera. But any full frame lens from Nikon or Canon adapted over to their mirrorless system will work seamlessly, no loss of image quality, no loss of focus speed, no loss of performance whatsoever. Um, so that's not something that should hold you back if you've been debating transitioning over if you're a Nikon or Canon shooter, um, which I'm sure if you're using a DSLR, you're probably using one or the two. Uh, you don't find as many people using Pentax or even some of the old Sony um, Alpha uh, DSLR cameras as well. Traditionally, it's going to be a Nikon or a Canon. But really on top of DSLR lenses um, from Nikon and Canon, if you can pretty much adapt on any lens that's ever been manufactured by any company uh, in any lens mount. So for example, here I have a Nikon lens on a Sony camera. You can still use that lens. You'll have to manually, focusing it, uh, manually focus it because it's uh, a manual focus lens, but you can still make images with it. You can still meter, you can still, um, create images, uh, I guess is what I'm trying to get at here with these lenses. And for me, this is a huge advantage because I still have a lot of old film lenses laying around. I still have a lot of old film cameras for that matter as well. Uh, but now I can use those lenses on my Sony mirrorless camera to actually repurpose them and use them on something other than a film camera. And a lot of people will do this because it'll give it a more cinematic look, um, sometimes a little bit more of a softer focus feel. It may shift the color a little bit because the coatings on these lenses weren't designed for a digital sensor. So there are a lot of different lens options out there for you. Now you gotta keep in mind, you may not have things like autofocus. You may have to set your settings manually um, because you don't have electronic communication between the lens and the camera. All that adapter is doing is just connecting one mount to the other um, and allowing you to use the lenses. So there are adapters out there for pretty much any lens that's ever been manufactured to mount onto any mirrorless camera. Uh, just gotta keep in mind that autofocus is not always something that you'll have and you will mostly have to use manual mode to set all the settings yourself uh, manually. So again, these cameras are very adaptable. Uh, you can save old lenses from gathering dust in the attic. If you have an old Pentax K1000 or a Canon AE-1 lying around, you can use some of those lenses again. You can use your current lenses from your Nikon or Canon DSLR on a smaller, more portable body. And there's even some specialized adapters, which will help improve the light gathering ability and allow for autofocus with certain lens and camera combinations. So most notably um, for autofocus with certain lens and camera combinations is using Canon lenses on a Sony camera. Uh, there are a couple autofocus out adapters out there for Canon lenses to work on a Sony camera and still maintain their autofocus. Um, I wouldn't say they're hundred percent seamless, uh, but I'd say they're probably about 95% of the way there and definitely very reliable. Um, I've used quite a few of them. I actually did transition over from Canon to Sony. So that was part of my decision process because I knew those adapters were out there. Um, unfortunately though, for Nikon lenses, there's really no good autofocus adapters for Nikon lenses to work on any other system besides Nikon. Uh, only really Canon has a couple of autofocus adapters out there not made by Canon specifically, but by third-party companies where you can use their lenses on other cameras like Micro Four Thirds or Fuji or something like that and still maintain autofocus. So something to keep in mind if you are a Canon shooter, there are some different options out there other than just Canon. So talking about focus for a little bit, because I think focus early on was something that was definitely lacking and was uh, holding people back from transitioning over to mirrorless cameras, uh, especially wildlife photographers and sports photographers and journalists who really rely on autofocus to be accurate and be consistent. Uh, it wasn't like that a few years ago. Um, really where we're at right now, we've come a long way with mirrorless technology, especially in the past year, year and a half, where we've been seeing Tremendous focus improvements with these cameras, um, some of which are outperforming DSLRs now. You're finding uh, focus points being edge to edge on the sensor itself. So no matter where your subject is in the frame, you're gonna have an autofocus point most likely that you can put on there. You don't have to worry about focusing and recomposing nearly as much as you would sometimes have to do with the DSLR because they didn't have as many focus points to work with. And there's even some of these cameras now that will have things such as face detection, eye detection and even animal eye detection for some specific models where they're going to find your subject's face or their eye 
lock on and even track it if you have tracking on and continuous focus on where it's going to follow and move it around the frame. So this is really great for any portrait photographers or wildlife photographers um, in using autofocus. And this is not something you'll find in every single mirrorless camera. You'll find it in some of the higher end models from certain brands, um, but it's becoming more and more popular and we are st starting to see it being implemented into more mirrorless cameras. And talking about focus peaking um, or manually focusing um, with focus peaking, because that's really a huge benefit, especially if you're using some of those old manual focus lenses, uh, like we were talking about a couple slides ago. So focus peaking, I have an example of that over here on the left of this bike rider here who is highlighted in red. That red highlight is actually the focus peaking working, telling me what part of my scene is in focus. So I know because this bike rider here is highlighted in red that he is the part of my image that's in focus. If I were to go and take a photo at that moment, that red highlight would not be saved on your camera. Uh, that's just an overlay that you're getting in the viewfinder or the rear LCD screen, depending which one you're using. And that's gonna tell you exactly where your focus is. So you don't have to worry about guessing if it looks sharp or not. You just have to worry about where that red overlay is, or you can also change it to green or to blue, um, depending on what your eye picks up more naturally. And it'll accurately tell you, okay, wherever that color is, that is what's in focus. And that's a huge advantage, again, especially if you're using some of those older lenses that are adapted over. That's something that I use all the time. Focus peaking just makes my life so much easier when using those lenses. You don't have to guess anymore and try to find where your focus is and try to see if it's uh, sharp or not. Uh, the focus peaking does all of that for you. And you can also zoom in digitally now while using manual focus, which was something you could do with DSLRs, but only when you were in live view, you could magnify in and check your focus. But now you can actually do that through the viewfinder because it's electronic. So you can have that camera being held up to your eye, magnify in, check your focus, make sure it's where it needs to be, and then go ahead and take the photo. So again, it's another time saver that you get. Um, there's a lot of time savers that we're talking about when it comes to mirrorless camera that will save you time and will help you create more images and uh, not risk missing a photo because you're looking for a setting or trying to focus. Um, so that's a really big benefit of mirrorless cameras is they can be a time saver. And then lastly here on this slide, uh, no more need for autofocus fine tune. So with DSLRs, uh, a decent amount of times you'll have to correct for front focusing or back focusing lenses. Um, that's something that can happen with any DSLR or any lens that it's paired with uh, where a camera may fall out of focus and you'll have to adjust for it. And that can be kind of annoying to do. It's not a very enjoyable process to do yourself uh, to actually make those adjustments so the focusing is accurate again. And if you're having somebody else do it, it can be a little bit costly. Uh, it's something that we do in the store, but we do charge for it and it's not inexpensive. Um, it definitely does cost a little bit of money, um, but with mirrorless cameras, you don't have to worry about autofocus fine tune anymore because you don't have to worry about your lenses front or back focusing. All of the focusing with these mirrorless cameras is done directly on the sensor itself. So it's hundred percent accurate. Wherever your focus point is, that is the sharpest part of your image. You don't have to worry about it missing slightly in front or slightly behind that point. Uh, it's just gonna be tack sharp wherever your focus point is on that mirrorless camera, which I think is huge. Again, another time saver and a money saver too, if you're having somebody else do it. So talking about sensor sizes, uh, because there are some mirrorless cameras out there that can give you a point and shoot sized camera that can have a micro four third size sensor or larger. And when it comes to mirrorless, you're really talking about three main sensor sizes. Uh, those three are full frame, APS-C and micro four thirds which are conveniently located right down here in the middle of this chart. Um, you have two on the right side, one over 2.5, which you'll traditionally find in a lot of point and shoot cameras, a lot of entry level point and shoot cameras. Then you jump up to a one inch sensor, which you'll find in a lot of higher end point and shoot cameras. And then you jump up to micro four thirds, which is where we start with uh, mirrorless cameras, uh, interchangeable lens mirrorless cameras, I should say, because point and shoots are still technically mirrorless. Uh, but for the sake of this presentation, we're talking about interchangeable lens mirrorless cameras that you can take lenses on and off. And micro four thirds is where you start. Uh, both Olympus and Panasonic might make micro four third size cameras. They both share the same lens mount, so you can swap lenses back and forth. And micro four thirds, because the sensor size is half the size of a full frame sensor, 
these cameras are very small along with the lenses being super small and super compact where you can really save a ton of size and weight by switching over to a micro four thirds size system. I'm seeing a lot of wildlife photographers switch over to Olympus uh, just because of how small and compacted, excuse me, how small and compact it is and the performance that you get out of it. These, those cameras are very fast focusing. They have some very high end glass and they are very capable. Um, so there are definitely a lot of good options out there if you're looking to save size and weight specifically with micro four thirds. Then you jump up to APS-C, kind of that middle ground between micro four thirds and full frame, where you're going to get a slightly larger sensor size, which also results in a slightly larger camera and slightly larger lenses, but is going to give you a little bit more resolution. You're going to have more uh, file detail or more detail to work with in your files because it's a physically a larger file now that you're working with because it's a larger sensor, but can still be a good way to save some size and weight when you compare it to full frame. Uh, you can find Nikon, Canon, Sony, and Fuji all making APS-C size mirrorless cameras. And then also, and then lastly, full frame, uh, which I'm sure probably many of you may be shooting already, whether it be a DSLR or you've already transitioned to mirrorless. Full frame is what you'll find a lot of photographers shooting. Uh, it's going to give you more resolution, more detail to work with, a larger file size, uh, but it's also going to result in larger lenses and larger cameras because you have to house that full frame sensor. Now, again, it'll still be smaller than a full frame DSLR, but the lenses aren't going to be much smaller because you still have to have a lens that's large enough to allow in enough light to cover the entire full frame sensor. So they still have to be physically um, large, um, I guess you could say, to cover that full frame sensor where you're not automatically going to save a ton or size of weight, a ton of size or weight on the lenses but you will save an okay amount of size and weight on the body itself. So it's a little bit of a trade-off, but if you're somebody looking to save a ton of size and weight, I highly recommend looking into micro four thirds. There's a lot of great options out there. And then lastly on this chart uh, is medium format, which there are actually a couple full or a couple medium format mirrorless cameras out there on the market um, from Fuji and from Hasselblad. Uh, but that's kind of in a category of its own. Uh, but just wanted to let you know that there are some medium format mirrorless cameras out there on the market as well, which I think is pretty cool. So talking about the viewfinder, because I think, again, the viewfinder is probably the biggest advantage that we have now with mirrorless cameras uh, and something that you just don't have with the SLRs. And on the left-hand side here, I have an electronic viewfinder. And on the right-hand side, we have an optical viewfinder. The first thing you probably will notice is more available shooting information. So instead of just having settings along the bottom in your optical viewfinder, you also now have settings along the right side, along the left side, and along the top. So you can see all of these settings and what they're set at while you're photographing. And if you need to make any adjustments, you can do it very quickly. You don't have to worry about fussing through the menu system to try to find a certain thing, um, which again, goes back to that time saving. Mirrorless cameras really are gonna save you a lot of time. And you can see these settings. If you don't wanna see them, however, you can turn them off. You can switch through the, the different display modes and not have any of these uh, settings showing on the right or left-hand side. So you're just gonna see your image. So if you, if you think that's distracting, you can turn those off as well, which is nice. But it is nice to be able to have those and check your settings quickly while you're shooting to make sure they're where they need to be. And because we have an electronic viewfinder now, we have the option to overlay different things on top of it, such as a live histogram. So you can make sure you're not clipping on your highlights or clipping on your shadows. You can overlay a digital level so you can make sure your horizon straight, which is something that I use a lot, especially when doing landscape photography handheld. I wanna make sure my horizon straight and I'm getting all the uh, scenery in my image that I want. And I don't have to correct my horizon after the fact and risk cropping something out off one of the corners. And really the biggest advantage uh, is seeing your exposure and depth of field in real time. So with this electronic viewfinder, what you see is what you're gonna get. So you're gonna see what your exposure looks like in that viewfinder. You're gonna know if it's overexposed, you're gonna know if it's underexposed. Uh, you're gonna know if your depth of field is where it needs to be or if you need to adjust your aperture to have more or less depth of field. You get a preview of that while you're using the viewfinder, which you don't have at all with a optical viewfinder. With the optical viewfinder, all you have to rely on is the meter in the bottom, which is not always 100% accurate, depending what metering mode you're using. 
And also depending the light in the situation that you're photographing can really throw that meter off. Whereas an electronic viewfinder, even if the meter is not uh, where it needs to be, you can see what your exposure looks like. You can actually visualize it before you take the photo, which again, a huge time saver. You don't have to worry about taking an image, reviewing it and say, oh no, that exposure is not where I need it to be. Make some adjustments and then go back and take it again, uh, so on and so on. You save all the time from doing that and again, run the chance that you're going to make more images and uh, create more images than before because you're just saving yourself time in the long run um, and you don't have to worry about fussing around with your settings nearly as much, which is a huge advantage. Again, more useful for manual focus as we talked about a few slides ago with the ability for focus peaking and the ability to zoom in digitally. Uh, you can also shoot video through the viewfinder now because we don't have a mirror that's actually blocking light coming out of the viewfinder like you would with a DSLR. You can shoot video through the viewfinder and actually have a playback of your video recording in the viewfinder itself. So if it's a really bright sunny day out, you don't have to worry about the glare and reflection coming off your LCD screen. You can hold it up to your eye, make sure your exposure is correct, uh, make sure your framing is correct, and make sure you have everything set where it needs to be. And then lastly, no viewfinder blackout for some models. So if you're shooting a burst with the DSLR, you know that every time you take a photo, that mirror flips up to allow the light to actually hit the sensor. And every time that mirror flips up, it's blocking any light coming through the viewfinder. So it blacks out for a second and you don't actually see that image being taken. And if you're photographing a really fast moving subject, that split second could allow that subject to get out of your frame. And then you're trying to follow and do a burst and it's completely gone, you missed your shot. Now with the electronic viewfinder, because we don't have that mirror, you can be shooting continuously, seeing and following and tracking your subject the entire time. And it's never gonna black out. It'll just look the same entire, it'll look exactly the same the entire time. And you're probably not even gonna know that you're taking photographs because you're not gonna have that blackout that you would get with a DSLR, uh, but you're gonna be holding down the shutter and there's usually a little indicator in the top right or the top left uh, that's gonna let you know that, okay, I'm actually taking photographs um, and doing a burst. So I think that's pretty cool, especially for any sports or wildlife photographers out there. In-body stabilization. I think this is probably the second most important feature when it comes to mirrorless. And I put it second in line because it's not something that you're gonna find in every single camera model out there. Unlike the electronic viewfinder, which you'll find in every single camera on the market that is mirrorless, in-body stabilization is only in some of them. Uh, you'll find it in a lot of the higher end cameras uh, it's definitely a uh, more advanced feature, um, but I think it's really an important feature and can really help you out. Um, and I'll explain more about that on the next slide. But really the stabilization now within body is being done directly on the sensor. So the sensor is actually the part inside the camera that's moving around to compensate for any shake or any movement that you have to allow you to shoot at slower shutter speeds without having any blurry images. So. How does that actually work and what does that mean? So what it means is you can pretty much stabilize any lens now, old or new. Um, so I can use those old vintage lenses that I have on my camera that has in-body stabilization. And I now have a stabilized setup, which is really great. Um, you can also use image stabilized lenses in conjunction with image stabilized cameras to actually improve it that much more, which I'll talk about at the bottom bullet point here in a minute. Um, but really how this works is Image stabilization is classified in numbers of stops. And for this example, we have four stops of image stabilization, which means we should be able to make the shutter speed four stops longer than the average guideline, which is one over the focal length, being the slowest shutter speed you would traditionally want to go down to with a non-stabilized camera. So if we're using a 50 millimeter lens, 1 50th of a second would be the slowest shutter speed we would want to go down to handheld to reduce the risk of any blur or any movement in our images. Now that's just a, a rule of thumb. Everybody is gonna be different on how stable they can hold the camera, but that's kind of a good starting point to work with. So again, if we're using that 50 millimeter lens on a non-stabilized camera, a 50th of a second is the slowest shutter speed we would wanna go down to. But if we're using that same 50 millimeter lens on a camera with in-body stabilization, we can now drop that all the way down to a quarter of a second, which is four stops longer than a 50th and still get the same amount of sharpness, the same amount of clarity, that we would get at a 50th of a second on a non-stabilized camera. So in-body stabilization now really allows you to shoot at much slower shutter speeds. You don't have to worry about boosting your ISO up nearly as high, especially when doing night photography 
Um, it allows you to shoot much larger telephoto lenses at slower shutter speeds because they're so heavy. Traditionally, you want to be at like a 500th or a 1,000th of a second to be able to hand hold them without any blur. You can shoot them at a lot lower shutter speeds now because of this in-body stabilization. And as I mentioned, uh, lenses working in conjunction with the cameras. There's some cameras like the Olympus EM1 Mark III. When you pair that with their 12 to 100 millimeter pro lens, that'll give you up to seven and a half stops of image stabilization. And I've seen photos taken with that camera in that lens that were handheld at three seconds and four seconds um, that are tack sharp. There's no motion blur. There's no movement whatsoever at three and four seconds handheld, which I think is incredible. Uh, I can't hold anything still for three or four seconds, let alone a camera. So the fact that the camera is doing all that compensating to actually make up for it is really remarkable. So the players who's actually making these mirrorless cameras and the answer is pretty much everybody right now has a mirrorless camera one way or another, uh, starting off with the big two Nikon and Canon. Uh, Nikon has their Z series mirrorless system and Canon has their R series. Both of them have gained a lot of popularity, especially this past year. Nikon just came out with their Z7 and Z6 Mark II. Uh, Canon came out with their R5 and R6 a couple of months ago. So those have gained a lot of popularity amongst Nikon and Canon shooters. Uh, you have Sony and Fuji. Uh, Sony was the first one to have a full frame mirrorless camera. Uh, so they've been doing it for quite a, quite a long time. They have a lot of different options out there. That is what I personally shoot. Um, and I've been very happy with that. Uh, then you also have Fuji as well. Uh, Fuji is really known for their APS-C sized cameras. They don't have anything full frame. Uh, but as I mentioned before, they do have a couple medium format mirrorless cameras, which is pretty cool as well. Then you have Panasonic and Olympus, uh, as again, commonly known for their micro four third size system, sharing the same lens mount, being able to swap lenses out back and forth. Uh, but Panasonic does also have a full frame lineup called their S series. So Panasonic does have some full frame cameras out on the market as well. So are mirrorless cameras better than a DSLR? And the answer is they're different. They're not always better. Um, there are definitely some ways that they are better and some ways that they're actually worse, which we'll talk about in a second. But I think mirrorless, as I said earlier, is definitely the future of camera technology and where we're really going uh, in the industry. Um, I think everything is going to be mirrorless. All these companies are going to put the majority of their effort into mirrorless design and innovation and producing those cameras and those lenses. Um, so I really do think it's the future and for a lot of good reasons. And I just want to run down this pros and cons list before we wrap it up. I have one or two more slides, um, but just wanted to kind of wrap it up with, with this as well. So a couple of the pros, uh, mirrorless cameras, they can definitely be smaller and lighter. Uh, you have equal image quality to comparable DSLRs, a huge lens support from legacy lenses. So for those Nikon and Canon shooters, the ability to use their DSLR lenses on the mirrorless system is a huge advantage. The ability to adapt lenses from other manufacturers, in-body stabilization, which we just spoke about, the electronic viewfinder and all the options that go along with that. And then also the ability for silent shooting with the electronic shutter, which is not something that I really covered uh, much at all, but I did want to touch on it here as being an advantage because there are a lot of photographers out there who uh, need to be a little bit stealthy if you're a wildlife photographer or an event photographer or a portrait photographer, and you don't wanna cause any distractions or draw any attention to yourself. So you kind of wanna be in the background. Many of these mirrorless cameras now can shoot completely silently when you put them into electronic shutter mode, which means you don't actually have a mechanical shutter opening and closing and allowing light to project onto that sensor. It's all being done electronically. So it's completely silent. And that's a huge advantage to a lot of people. And I did want to did I did want to share that as well as one of the pros for mirrorless. And a couple of the cons: uh, smaller native lens systems. That's mainly when you're talking about Nikon and Canon. They haven't been making these full frame cameras nearly as long as the other mirrorless cameras out there on the market. So they don't have as many native lenses available for those two systems. Uh, but you do have the ability to adapt lenses over. Uh, the electronic viewfinder, again, while it does have so many advantages, isn't always to everybody's liking. It's definitely a different experience than using an optical viewfinder. Um, it does take a little bit of time to adjust to and get used to. But I think if you give yourself the chance to really work with it and to use it, you're going to see those advantages over time. It just may take a little bit of getting used to and a little bit of working with uh, to get yourself comfortable with it. 
autofocus performance, again, it can vary a little bit from camera to camera, but over the years, it's improved greatly. Um, really, the past year or so, a lot of the cameras that have been coming out onto the market have amazing autofocus performance, especially some of the higher end cameras. Uh, so if you're somebody who relies on autofocus for sports or wildlife, there are definitely some good options out there for that. And then lastly, battery life. Uh, battery life is one thing that is definitely lacking across the board. These mirrorless cameras now will draw a lot more power because of that electronic viewfinder, which means your battery life isn't gonna last as long as it would with your DSLR, which just means you gotta carry an extra battery or two around with you than you normally would with your DSLR, which I don't think is a huge downfall, um, but for some professional photographers, they like not having to switch out a battery every couple of hours if they're shooting all day long. Um, so battery life is something that's lacking. It's definitely gotten better over the years and I think will only continue to get better. Uh, but as of right now, it is still lacking when you compare it directly to DSLRs. And then lastly, just some mirrorless accessories I kind of wanted to touch on to make the experience much better with a mirrorless camera. Uh, so one thing that I always use is an L bracket, um, which I have centered over here in the middle, um, which is going to give you an Arca Swiss style plate on the bottom and also on the left side of your camera. So if you want to shoot vertically, you can do so now with it um, without actually having to turn your head 90 degrees and have the camera kind of hanging off the side of the tripod. You can just physically rotate the camera clamp it into the side and shoot vertically now, uh, keeping everything centered on top of the tripod. Also adds a little bit of protection, which is nice. Um, another thing, camera cages, you'll see a lot of people using because these cameras are so small. Uh, this is a way that you can add on different accessories like microphones or monitors or different things like that, which you'll see a lot of people using for doing video. Um, speaking of the cameras being so small, um, because of that, their ergonomics aren't always as good as DSLRs, uh, especially if you have a larger hand. DSLRs are tr traditionally going to be a little bit more comfortable in your hand because of the larger grip. But what you can add on to some of these mirrorless cameras is an additional hand grip, which will give you a little bit more to grab onto, which can really make the, the experience of using mirrorless a lot more enjoyable. A lot of these will also have a built-in tripod plate as well. So kind of a two-in-one package, which is nice. Uh, lightweight and compact tripods are getting more and more popular now because of these cameras being so lightweight and compact. You don't really need to carry around a huge bulky tripod anymore or really a tripod at all for certain situations because of in-body stabilization. But when you do need a tripod, you don't need something nearly as bulky and nearly as heavy as you may have had with your DSLR. And then lastly, gimbals, uh, different motorized gimbals. You're seeing a lot of videographers use with mirrorless cameras because they're so light and weight, they're so lightweight and compact. They can get one of these gimbals to stabilize their video footage. And you're seeing more and more people doing that now. And more and more people are just shooting video in general. Um, so there's a lot of accessories out there for that as well. But did just want to highlight a couple of those. Uh, before getting to my last slide here, which is just my contact information, um, my email at the top, which I'll also put down in the chat for you guys. If you want to just copy and paste that, if you guys have any questions after the program is over, you can also feel free to just take a, a photo of this, uh, this screen or take a screenshot with your computer, uh, just so you have that for your records. Please do reach out to me anytime, whether you have any questions, whether you're looking for any, for any gear or any equipment. If you're looking to make the transition to mirrorless and are wondering what's the best option for you, I'm happy to have those conversations one on one and really help you out in any way that I can. Our website, huntsphoto.com, um, which you'll find all of our different promotions that we have going on for the holidays right now. You'll find our education over there, so the classes and programs that we do. And then you'll also find our lab services or so printing services as well if you want to have any prints made for the holidays. You can do that over on our website as well. And then lastly, just our Facebook page, Hunts Photo and Video. Uh, we post different photo contests on there, share a lot of different photos and just different fun and engaging content. Uh, also I've been posting some different holiday specials and some holiday deals on Facebook as well. So definitely go and check that out if you guys are interested. Um, but with all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen, see if any questions have come in. Uh, if not, uh, now is the time to ask any questions that you guys may have, uh, whether you want to put them down in the chat or just unmute yourself. Uh, either would be fine with me. And I think everybody is still muted too. So just as a heads up, if anybody is trying to talk, uh, I think everybody was muted. On your slide that had the comparison of sensor sizes. Yep. 
Is that the scale? Um, so that is pretty close to the scale of the different center sizes. So let me go ahead and pull that back up. Let's see here. It's going to go back. Oh, now I closed out of it. Where did we go here? So yeah, this is going to be pretty close to the scale. I mean, it's not 100% accurate, but it's going to give you kind of a good idea. Uh, the physical size is actually listed here. So you'll get the actual physical size of the sensors. Um, so that will probably give you a better idea uh, of the scale between them. Um, and the crop factor as well. So uh, with the micro four thirds, you have a two times crop factor, which means that any lens that you put on there is actually gonna be twice that focal length. So if you have a 50 millimeter lens on a micro four third size camera, you're really having a hundred millimeter equivalent lens. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. That's another good way that you can actually save by size and weight because you can put a, say a 300 millimeter lens on there. That's pretty small and compact. But in reality, that's a 600 millimeter lens because of that two times crop factor that you have. With APS-C, it's 1.5. So it's a 50% crop factor. So you're getting 50% more magnification than what the lens is actually reading. So if it's a 100 millimeter lens, you're actually getting a 150 millimeter equivalent um, of a lens or actually usage of the lens um, when you're taking photos. So uh, just a little bit more on that. Yeah, I noticed the micro four thirds one appears to be the same aspect ratio as all the other ones, which is not correct. But. Yeah, it, it, I think it's just for example here. Uh, but yeah, it is the, you're, you'd be correct in that. Okay. So I just recently did a field trip and we live in Utah and there's a lot of sunshine. Mm -hmm. And so we have an RX-10 and you know, I have a, I have a D850. And, so when you see the viewfinder, it's very difficult sometimes. I saw people who really had a problem to find and to, to see the picture on the on the, the mirrorless camera. So I was able to see everything with my 850. So, so because the sun was so bright, they were having trouble seeing it, you're saying? Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, again, compensate for that with your settings. So you're just going to have to really underexpose your image to be able to get a more viewable shot. So you will have to play around with a little bit, especially in those harsh lighting situations. Um, and you'll have to play around with the different metering modes, but you can actually adjust your settings so you can get a more accurate preview in your viewfinder of what it'll look like as well. OK, thanks. There is a question in the chat. I did see that. Uh, are adapters for existing lenses readily available? They are um, for the autofocus ones for Nikon and Canon. Um, those have been on a slight back order just because those cameras have been really popular right now. Um, but for other adapters out there for like just other lens mounts for um, non Nikon and Canon lenses, uh, they are readily available and they're fairly inexpensive, especially if you're not getting anything with electronic communication, which most of them don't have anywhere between 30 to $50. Um, NovaFlex and Photodiox are both very popular adapter companies uh, making adapters for all sorts of lenses. So those would be the two that I personally recommend. We do sell both of them as well. We don't stock every single adapter just because there's hundreds of them, uh, but we do have access to ordering them. So if you have some lenses that you're looking to get some adapters for, shoot me an email. I'll put my email down in the chat for you guys, as I mentioned I would, uh, and I can help you out with that. Um, they are readily available and out there on the market. Can you generalize about cost DSLR versus mirrorless? Yeah, I would say it's pretty comparable. Um, you're gonna find similar price points for similar level cameras. Um, so for instance, the Nikon uh, Z7 Mark II that just came out was priced at $3,000. I would say that's most comparable to their D850, which when that came out was around $3,500. Um, with Canon, they had their EOS R5, which came out this year, which is com most comparable to the 5D Mark IV. Uh, the EOS R5 came out at $3,899. The 5D Mark IV came out at around $3,500. So very similar uh, price points um, between the two systems, both DSLR and mirrorless, uh, depending on what level camera you're looking at. Would you expect that uh, since all the emphasis on new equipment is going to mirrorless, that the old DSLR stuff would, you know, come down in price? 
Probably, um, probably because you'll see more people selling it. Uh, first of all, um, I think the newer products, you may see some price breaks here and there. Um, but I think ultimately what you're going to see is the used market start to be flooded more and more uh, with the used DSLRs and used lenses. So they'll be more readily available on the used market. Um, you may start to see next year some, some larger rebates on DSLR lenses and cameras. Um, but I think both Nikon and Canon are still going to continue to support their DSLRs, uh, still do repairs and things along those lines. So they're not completely killing it off by any means. So I don't think they're going to blow out any of the inventory that they have. I don't think they have any need to, but you may see some more aggressive rebates as time goes on. Anybody else? Very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you.